trauma is another thing. Something has happened to, a lot of times it's the parents, when the parents were kids, trauma, something like really serious. You grow up, you do the best you can, you try to cope, but things just sort of fall apart for you at the worst time. Relationships are hard. You have health problems. There's all kinds of things. So that plus the evictions, the incarceration that stays on your record, the bad credit, the cost of housing, the utilities, you know, all of those things create the right mixture for families and then they become homeless. And I always use the example, it's like they fall into a 20 foot hole and we give them a 10 foot ladder. Welcome to Midlife Dialogues, where I talk to people 50 and over who are doing interesting and inspiring things with their lives. Today, I'm talking to Diane Nyland. Welcome, Diane. It's so nice to talk with you. Well, Leslie, thank you for having me. This is uh, quite an opportunity. Now, let's start with some background on the situation that you have chosen to devote so much of your time and energy to. I read that there are 7.2 to 8.2 million children in the U.S. who are homeless. And I just think that is a staggering and sobering amount of children, and it's hard to wrap my brain around that. Is that the number that you also work with? Yeah, that is a number. I really have to work at verifying it because it is not a number that's commonly used. And and that's part of the whole dilemma of family homelessness is the fact that we don't identify properly and we don't count and we don't know, so we don't do anything. You started advocating for homeless children and their families back in 2005. Is that right? Well, that's actually when I went on the road. I mean, I've worked as an advocate and worked in shelters and ran shelters and that since the mid 80s. How did you get started doing that? Well, I, I sort of stumbled into it in the mid 80s. The economy was really bad and I had lost my job. And a friend said, I know a six month job you can get working at a social service agency. And I'm like, I've never done that before. And I just was doing a agency self-study. So it was just kind of a, an administrative thing. And then at the same time, homelessness was really becoming a big issue in the mid 80s. And my boss turned to me and said, you're the, the only one that's really not with an overflowing plate right now. So you take care of starting a homeless shelter. I looked at him and I said, I'm a philosophy major. I'm not a social worker. And he says, yeah, but start the shelter. So that started me in, in this whole work. And it was like, this is just really out of hand. And that was back then when things were way easier than they are now. Then I started realizing that the problem was not so much the people and, you know, their circumstances were immediately bad, but they weren't the source of the problem. The source of the problem was upstream. What do you mean by upstream? Well, upstream is like, why are people becoming homeless? And, you know, at that time, a lot of it was the economy, but then there's policies that make it really hard for people to make ends meet. Or, you know, if you were released from prison, you're not able to get into um, subsidized housing. Housing. So unless you have like a really good job when you come out of prison, you don't have the money and you can't get into housing. And that's just one example. Families that are in the foster care system, they have scores of problems that are caused by the system. So, you know, there's things that need to be done upstream so that we don't get so many people in the system of homelessness. Right. And then what happened in 2005 that set you out on the road? Well, in 2005, I had a really great job in an agency that I started started myself to work with the schools and help them get their act together in getting kids into school the way they're supposed to when the kids are homeless. So there was a law that I actually helped pass too. So that kind of fueled my fire that said, basically, these kids are homeless. They get into school right now. They don't need to prove homelessness. You need to take their word. You need to get them into school immediately. And so the school districts were having, you know, they're struggling with figuring that out. And so I had a job. It was through the state where I was doing training. So I was talking to the school personnel. I'm like, gosh, they really don't understand. They don't recognize homeless kids. They don't understand their situations. And so a colleague and I hired a film crew and we were going to do a film of kids talking about homelessness and what it's like and what school meant to them. Just using that as a little tool to educate the educators. And just the week before I was going to get started doing that, my program got changed and I was out of a job. And so then I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, I'm 55 years old. What am I going to do now? We had to cancel the film crew. So that film 
that would have made a difference is not going to get made. And so I just had this whole conversation with myself and I realized that I needed to do it. I've done photography all my life so that, you know, I'm like, how hard can this be, right? So part of my plan was I knew I needed to sell my townhouse and that really broke my heart because I really loved my townhouse. The other piece of that was I was going to buy a small motor home and I'm going like, I've never in my life been in a motor home, but I'm going to buy one. I'm going to live in it. I'm going to get a video camera. I'm going to do all this. And I'm like, this is crazy, but I'm going to do it. And so I did it. Set off in 2005 and started interviewing kids and families about homelessness and what school meant to them. I've not stopped since because it was such a powerful experience. The families were so happy to have somebody to listen to them. People don't get to tell their stories. So I got these amazing stories. And actually my first film is My Own Four Walls. It's right on our Hear Us website and people can watch it. It's 20 minutes and it'll make you weep, but it's all the kids talking. It's no adult talking heads. It was so, so satisfying to get these stories and I knew they'd be effective. And so I just kept doing it. And then it kind of grew into states hiring me to, to do films for their states. It's a niche nobody else felt into and I really love doing it. When you sold your townhouse, you decided to buy a motorhome. Did you think you were going to do that for a year or what was your plan at the time? My mom asked me, she was very supportive too, but she's like, oh, how long are you going to do this? And I said, I don't have any idea. I said, I'll know when I need to stop. So today you live in what? Tell us, that's where you are right now in your Airstream trailer? Or, you know, I'm going to turn 74 in a couple months. So I'm like, yeah, you better start at least getting a home base of some sort. I still have a little camper that I travel around and work from. So my sister and brother-in-law live in the mountains of North Carolina, what you see behind us. They have enough space and enough resources. And they said, if you want to ever stop traveling and you want to build a house here on our property or something, and I'm like, oh, build a house. It just sounds so permanent. And so my sister and I came up with an Airstream camper and I bought it myself. So I'm here. So this is actually my home base and it's just absolutely delightful. It looks lovely. Is it warm in the wintertime? The camper, actually, I, I went through this past winter and it was fine. I mean, I have a high tolerance for weird temperatures. Temperatures. I can always go into their house if it's really bad. So I have options. Sounds perfect. And so how often now do you get out on the road? And when you're on the road now, what are you doing? Are you still making documentary films? Speaking, it's really weird to not be going out as often as I was. Because I mean, for 20 years, I literally lived on the road. Now I'm here most of the time, but I'm working on some projects here in uh, North Carolina. But I've got a uh, book tour coming up in September and October. I also don't know because tomorrow I could get a call from the, like the local shelter here that I'm, you know, connected with them. If they called me and they said, Diane, we need you to help do a film project, I would do a film project with them. So I don't know. I ended up going to Chattanooga about a year ago when something just outrageous happened down there. No media was covering it. I'm like, how can you have 800 people becoming homeless when the county executive closed down a motel where all these folks were staying and just threw them out like with four hours notice and nobody covered it. So I went down there and I started interviewing and making little short videos about it because nobody was paying attention. Then what happens with those short videos you made? Well, the short videos are on my website and they're available free. Nobody has to do anything other than going. It's YouTube and Vimeo and I have a link and I've got a menu of all these little videos. I think I've made like over a hundred videos since I've been on the road. My colleague, she's a professor at uh, Northern Illinois University, Laura Vasquez. I'll give her a, a, a girl because she taught me editing and filming and, and all that way back when. So we had one film that it was actually been on PBS oh. and uh, it was On the Edge, Family Homelessness in America. I'll put a link to all those too, so people can easily find them. And um, then I will go and do presentations and show a film and get people to talk about it. Tell us about your organization, Hear Us. Well, Hear Us, actually I started it. It's a one person organization. I do everything. I have a board. Uh, we're a nonprofit. So we are legitimate. I started out with the name Homeless Education Awareness Raising in the U.S., H-E-A-R-U-S. So I ended up very quickly shortening it just to hear us. It was with the purpose of raising awareness about homelessness. My first film, My Own Four Walls, that was on a DVD. 
And, you know, I sold it so I'd make enough money to pay for gas, which used to be cheap. But then I do presentations and do whatever I can do. I just, you know, I, every morning I look at news stories about family homelessness. Sometimes I find out that school districts are doing something maybe wrong. And so I can intervene and help families get into school. So I can just do that usually from afar, but I'll show up to, you know, just do what I can do. So then I do film editing and writing and I'm never bored. What sorts of results do you see? Are you making a difference? You know, I am because every time I go and do a film where I'm interviewing the family and I hear somebody say, well, that McKinney Vento law, that's really good because my kids were able to stay in school. And I mean, I've heard that so many times and I'm like, yes, that's a law that I helped get passed and was really involved in. So it's like somebody, a chef hearing the food was really good at your restaurant. I'm like, oh, that is so satisfying. And I do trainings with schools and I do work with the um, states to make sure that they're doing what they're supposed to do and, and they're doing the best they can, but there's still a lot of work to be done. So I'll hear about a school that's maybe not doing the right thing and try to get involved. So I don't know what kind of difference I'm making, but I think I am. Yeah, sounds like you are. Tell us about this book you have coming out. What's the title and what's it about? Okay, so I drive a lot, right? I've driven in the 20 years that I've been on the road, I've driven probably 500,000 miles in my camper. 49 states, not Alaska yet. And I didn't drive my camper in Hawaii, but I rented a car. So I drive a lot and I think a lot. And I'm like, we need to somehow reach out to the families. I'll hear families talk about, oh, when I first became homeless, I was so stressed. I didn't know this. I didn't know that. You know, I made a mistake and I, you know, got kicked out of the shelter. And I'm like, we need a book. I handbook for families that are homeless so that they can at least avoid some of the mistakes that you'll make when you're homeless. So somehow I started thinking about these three women that I know. Their name all happens to be Melissa. And I'm like, those three would be perfect for sharing their information, what they learned when they were homeless, because I know that they had a lot of experience and they've done it the best they can raising their kids despite horrible things. So I contacted each one of them and I said, this is my idea. And they're like, we are in. So they were excited about being able to share their knowledge. And so then I contacted my friend, Diana Bauman, who uh, we've worked on other projects. And we've known each other a long time and she's very much involved in this issue. And I'm like, do you want to write a book? She's like, yeah, I do. So we started about a year ago interviewing the, the Melissas and getting their input. And Diana and I would write. And so then we'd share our writings with them. Are we representing you right now? The book will be out in September. And it is not sugar-coated, which is just great because it's about time we start letting the families talk about how bad the system is. And they're not blaming anybody, but it's like, you folks don't understand what it's like to raise a family when you're homeless. And they come out with the things and make systemic suggestions. And besides the families getting these books. We also want the people that work with homeless families to have this book because they're going to go, I had no idea that this was going on. And if any lawmakers would read it, oh, that would be the best. So we're going to try to give as many copies of the book away. And we're going to encourage people that have enough money to buy one, give one. You know, we'll get some grants and stuff, but we'll give some books away. What's the title? The title is The Three Melissas, The Practical Guide for Surviving Family homelessness. And our website for that book is um, simple. It's three, the number three, Melissa's, plural, dot org. And can we pre-order that book? Actually, we're doing pre-orders for bulk copies because we know school districts, especially, and, and maybe shelters are going to be buying a lot of copies then to give away. So I'm just trying to get some sense of like, do I order a million copies or do I just order a hundred, you know, and already we're closer to a million than a hundred. So that's a good thing. That's amazing. Can individuals pre-order? Uh, individuals, we're going to hold off on that now just because it's just me processing the pre-orders, but the, the books actually will be available on Amazon and other online places. That sounds great. I'll get a copy for sure. Yeah. You know, Diana and I were able to add a, a few um, little extra chapter-ish things. We, added up the number of years that we have between us working in homelessness and it's 75. We know a lot about family homelessness and we were able to kind of put the period at the end of the sentence for the three Melissas and, you know, they're not making this up, folks. 
this is what's going on. So we're going to try to make it as user friendly as possible. So it's not like somebody getting a big fat book and having to look through footnotes and everything, you know, it's really designed so that a family in stress because they're in a homeless situation, somebody hands them the book and says, this might help you hopefully have a book that's helpful. Right. What would you tell people who don't have a lot of experience or knowledge about homeless children and their families? What would you, what's one thing you would want people to know? Homelessness happens to families when they least expect it. There's so many things that can cause families to become homeless. And we don't know, you know, we who are comfortably housed going along in our lives, we don't know what these families are going through. Some do amazing things. I have a kid that was in our shelter that's a doctor now. They can make it out of there, but it's it's just really, really hard and it's unnecessarily hard. Yeah. And what can people do if they want to get involved and do something that will help homeless children and families? Well, my friend Diana wrote the book. It's a very thin book. It's 24 pages. The Charlie book, 60 Ways to Help Homeless Kids and it's available through Amazon. It's got 60 ways to help. It's really a very practical, useful guide on things that people can do big and little. You know, becoming informed is the most important thing. So find out a little bit about homelessness. You know, I've tried to write a reader-friendly book on homelessness, my book of travels and families. It's called Dismazed and Driven, my look at family homelessness in America. And it's one of those things where it will be a eye-opener for you. And you'll just kind of go, I had no idea that that was going on. So yeah. be- become informed and then get involved. Yeah, that's good. It's not in my genes to retire. And the issue is really important. And I, you know, I have relationships with the families. Yeah, I can't just go sit on a beach somewhere and, you know, not that that's wrong, but I just, it's not in my nature. Right. I can tell that. And it seems like there's a lot more to do. It's getting worse, not better. The problem of family homelessness and and homelessness in general is getting worse, a lot worse. I mean, like now you even have people in the middle income brackets going, oh my God, I had to give up my apartment because I couldn't afford it anymore. And I had to downsize or move, move home. So the economy and policies that have been crazily put in place, it's made making it a lot worse. So those who are, you know, in fragile situations, they're falling through the cracks. It's the worst I've ever seen it in the 40 years that I've been doing this. Do you have hope? Well, as far as the system goes, there are some people that are trying to do some sensible things that will make a difference depending on our political, you know, decisions that are being made, because that's where a lot of this comes down. I see bad things in the sense that there's, I don't know how many states now that have made camping, which you like, this isn't really camping, this is homelessness without a shelter made that illegal. So, you you know, people are thrown in jail and the Supreme Court's about ready to, you know, make a decision on criminalizing homelessness is basically what it's going to do. So that's the bad side. The good side is that there's a lot of good people out there doing some good things locally, but also there's some policies that are starting to, to really make sense and make me go, oh, I can't believe I just read that and it's good news. So I'm, I'm not overly encouraged, but I'm at least at least not totally depressed. Well, thank you so much, Diane. It has been great talking to you and learning a little bit about this topic and what you're doing with your life. It's so important. And thanks everyone for listening to Midlife Dialogues. Watch for our part two with Diane coming up. See you next time.